This, this is the part of the show where I upset one group or the other. If I say everything should be data-driven, you get all the creatives and passionate brand people being like, no, it's about winning. It's about winning their hearts and getting them to love and fall in love with your brand. And then you get the data-driven people be like, it's none of that shit. It's all real. Hi, I'm Matt, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive ROI from approaching CX and culture together. I'm really excited to be here today with Neil Hoyne, who's the best-selling author of this great book, Converted, which Neil, I really enjoyed reading and I'm excited to talk to you about today. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. And uh, Neil is the um, Google's chief measurement strategist, and uh, he's had a really cool vantage point working with over 25 marketers over the past 10 plus years. So, Neil, looking forward to hearing some of your experiences helping companies um, drive more experimentation. I love it. Drive more experimentation, make more money, make better decisions. It's, a, it's all packaged up together. All, all, everything that we hope to become as companies, right? Exactly. I like to talk about how companies in CX can build a culture of experimentation, which is really a key part of your book. I guess just to get us started, um, your book's organized around three imperatives. Um, can you share a little bit more about what the three imperatives are with relationships and conversations and, and, uh, and change? Of course. And openly admitting that they're the byproduct of the editorial process where they're like, it needs to be has to be three or five major sections. Two or four doesn't sound like an official book. The first section, though, is really, if you think about this around understanding customers as a whole, the first section was really meant to get people to understand that they're having conversations with customers, not single interactions, but more importantly, to think about customers as people, not metrics. And oftentimes in our quest to become data-driven, we have dashboards that say, we received X number of of visitors from this channel and why percent actually bought something, the rest left. It's very hard for people to fixate to say, who are these people? And it's very hard for them to look beyond those individual sessions because that's how the data is presented to them to think, well, if somebody didn't buy now, maybe they're going to come back and buy later. It also starts introducing a little bit about the behavioral component to say, even though we want customers to go through our funnel and be really rational, they're not. And they're going to go back and forth almost in this chaotic circle before they decide to make a purchase or to fill out a lead form or download our app. And the best we can do as any company is just to be part of that process and manage it the best we can, not to be able to direct people in a perfect way. And so that's the first is just getting people comfortable with the language and the ideas. The second is saying, well, if you're in conversations, what happens if somebody comes back? What happens if you see somebody a second time? Does that journey start all over again? And those ideas, they seem common when we go through it. Of course, customers come back. We want to retain our customers and we want to develop those relationships. And it's starting to actually bridge that between what companies use to make decisions and what they know intuitively is going to happen. And so the first is really just meeting them on the language where they understand that these conversations are happening. The second is to say, you know, all those things you know are happening with your customers. Let's put a language a structure. Let's start to bring some data into the picture so that you can actually prove the ROI to your organization, that what you feel and what you know in your heart is in fact quantitatively true. And then the third one is, if we're talking about relationships uh, I, in the second part, the third one is really the self-help guide, which is say, if your company is an absolute disaster, you're going to have a hard time building relationships with anybody. And so we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about things like experimentation, like politics, like transformation, like hiring to say, if you really want to make sure you're the best you that you can be as a company, then these are the things you need to get in place to really make the first two sections really happen for your organization. And so everything's gradual. It's a data-driven book for people that don't like data. Like I don't, I don't, I'm a data guy. I don't read data books at night. I, I don't know anybody that's like, oh, it's nine o'clock at night. What do you want to do? Let's read SQL. Let's, let's read cloud. And so it's meant to be approachable in that way. It's not only uh, fun and engaging in how it's written, but it's actually, I don't know if you can tell it here, but the size of it is slightly not quite as overwhelming as large. So it's fun and approachable, even if you can hold it in one hand. Oh, it's throwable. I tell people that. I'm like, you can throw us. First, you're right. It wasn't really meant to. You can carry it around. So it doesn't have to be something that's a burden to have with you as a guidebook. But the other thing is that sometimes you are here. I'll borrow it off my desk. If you have somebody in your office where you're like, they should read this, then you can take it and you can, you can throw it at them and 
And this is when you throw it at your analyst or you throw it at your CFO and say, this is what we're trying to do as marketers. Well, self-help, self-improvement, sometimes you just want to get it off your chest or, or, or make it a projectile. Um, you know, when you, in, in the first imperative, when you're talking about uh, conversations and, you know, really about how brands can um, build more personalized experiences and connect with people in the right emotional way around the brand. You know, there's been a lot of focus on how brands can build more direct to consumer relationships. So how is, how do you see the balance shifting between like advertising and brands trying to engage people more directly in these conversations, not one or the other, but a balance between the two. You know, I, I see a lot of companies who are saying, yes, we want to go to the D2C route because it's popular, it's hot. And that's one of those things where I look at the difference between strategies and tactics. On tactics, has like everyone's building a D2C route. We should build a D2C route without thinking through why they're building a D2C route. Now, for some companies, it's, it improves access to market, speed to market. The most compelling case I have is it lets you know who your customers actually are. If you're selling all of your products through Target or through Amazon, I'd almost make the argument they're your customers because they're the ones that are buying your products. Now, they may be selling them again to an end user, but all you know is what Amazon's buying and what Target's buying, and you're beholden to those relationships in order to make your business work. It was actually, this didn't make it into the book, but a large appliance company I worked with actually started going D to C. And I was like, why the hell are you going D to C? The cost of shipping your, your products, your appliances is massive. And they're like, oh, we're going to be in the red all the time. And but they said, for us, the reason we're going D to C is because we want to understand and engage with those customers, understand their journey, their buying process, have that relationship directly with them. Because even if it's only a small fraction of our sales, the insights that we can then use to apply to our customers beyond the traditional retail channels allows us to build better creatives, better content, better products than what we could get simply asking Best Buy how many units of our product they pushed in a given month. I started my um, consulting career working more with consumer goods and retailers and then transitioned more to work with other categories like healthcare and financial services and B2B. But the points you're making in the consumer world really resonate. A lot of brands, you know, um, like whether it's P&G or L'Oreal or, or, uh, or others, they've, they've built their brands advertising to consumers, but they sell through retailers. And, and a lot of what's happened is they, as they've engaged in digital with e-commerce and content and loyalty programs and things like that, they're able to build stronger insights and that insight to action loop gets faster because they have these direct relationships. So I agree hundred percent. A lot of the value of experience as a strategy is because you're able to develop deeper relationships and build deeper insights. That doesn't mean you stop selling through other channels, but having that direct to, to customer relationship, whether you're D to C or, or, you know, or B to B, you know, it, it allows you to have deeper insights and build better experiences. That's exactly what you're going for. And even if you've seen the trend, a lot of the primarily D to C only companies have gone into traditional retail channels because you need access to it. It's a valuable channel. It's the same reason Google advertises on TV. Yes, we believe in the strength of digital, but TV also reaches people that digital can't reach at particular moments. And I always say to people this, even when they look at it and they say, there's no way we can displace our physical channels. We still need those partners. I say, absolutely. But the goal is, as you say, to get those insights is so that you can drive better decisions than your competitors. So you can deliver better products, better value to your end consumers because you have those information and those insights that they might lack by simply relying on their retail partners as a whole. Another theme in your book about customer lifetime value and relationships is you, you know, you don't want to be right on average and wrong all the time and convert the average customer or the wrong customer. You want to know the customers who have higher customer lifetime value. And you actually talk about using journey analytics along the journey or customer or lookalike analytics with your advertising so that you can find people who have the higher CLV upfront, you know, and then, and, and that, that actually, I think is really powerful um, insight is that, you know, your advertising needs to focus on attracting the customers who have a higher CLV. You need to figure out how to attract the people that will connect with you. 
And for every business, it's going to be a different group. Just like you're in the real world, you're not going to get along with everybody. And the worst thing you can do that I joke about in the book is have somebody's opinion of somebody you love and that you value. I was thinking about my wife and then averaging her thoughts about your life with your Uber driver. Like, it's just not going to be like, oh, you're both good. I gave them a five-star rating. And so your opinions carry the same amount of weight because for product direction, you end up with the average. Airlines are a fantastic example. They make a lot of revenue from the people sitting up front. In some numbers, 10% of passengers are driving 78% of revenue on that flight. Now, it doesn't mean you ignore all the passengers in coach. You still have seats to fill. But if you're thinking about creative and you're thinking what's important, servicing those groups will do you well. And even in some cases, and I'll admit, for the companies that aren't ready to do this, even having those insights are enough. So if you look at what your average customer wants and say you're an average-driven company that's always done this, that's fine. We're not judging. But wouldn't you just like to know what those higher value customers are leaning towards? And would that nudge you in one direction or the other on your creatives? You know, it's really interesting that, like, you know, there's always room to improve. And I, I, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a lot of companies that still treat marketing as if it's like a creative activity and not 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 enough analytically driven i think you can have both you know emotion and and hearts and and insight and analytics but too often we build personas or design use design tools to come up with great creative without leveraging all the data we have now to be able to find those personas in your advertising or to understand who's actually showing up on your website or mobile app and start experimenting and tailoring the experience. A lot of the work that I do in, in the company I founded, JourneySpark Consulting, is making personas actionable. So you can actually use data to target them and enable experimentation. I can see that in a lot of the work you do with uh, is, is being able to find people and treat them differently through the data that you're, that you're building. This, this is the part of the show where I upset one group or the other. If I say everything should be data-driven, you get all the creatives and passionate brand people being like, no, it's about winning. It's about winning their hearts and getting them to love and fall in love with your brand. And then you get the data-driven people be like, it's none of that shit. It's all real. And here's, here's a balance I strike with it is to say, first of all, it is exactly that in understanding who those customers are and making them real. But what it's also about is managing the tension between both sides. Personas are great to be like, and Carolyn is a 32 year old mom that lives out in the suburbs and buys these products and we envision her and that's great, but I'm sure there's plenty of people that will end up in that persona that will disagree with the characteristics of that persona. The data people will tell you that. And if you use the data people, the data people are going to do this hyper-targeting to be like, and we understand every dimension of every person. And you're like, I can't deliver individual creatives to everyone, at least not now. So I need to be able to put people into buckets and cohorts or maybe aggregate them together. And what, what we're really pointing out here is a necessary skill for marketers to get this to work is to be able to manage the tension on both sides to build those personas. To have that creative side to make these people real in the minds of the marketers that are trying to serve them, while on the other hand, offering enough flexibility in those personas to allow the data to surface variations from them or developments, the maturity of those personas so that they stay relevant. I worked with one company, their personas were nearly eight years old because they couldn't give up those people. They couldn't admit that those people left. And the other problem that companies run into with them is they can't admit that new people are coming in. These are their people and their audience. And oftentimes you have to ask them when they, when they declare things, they say, well, our, our personas are not price sensitive, right? Okay. That's great. Is it because of your personas or because you built a product that is so great that they're willing to pay whatever you price it at? And so sometimes you really need to look at not only those personas, but also the larger market. How do your products and your strategies play into how those people want to interact and who might you win or lose if you change, you know, if you become somebody different. Yeah, things evolve. Nothing can be, you know, done in stone. Otherwise, you can't evolve it um, unless you're a really cool sculptor and you can evolve things rapidly as you go, right? <laughs> Even if there's not laws in marketing, laws that can say exactly uh, everybody will click four times and then buy my product. God, I wish it was that easy, but that's what makes people fun. And, and I'll say this, not to discourage anybody. And I know it can come away. Some people are going to start writing me notes about the power of personas. It's not to discourage people, but it's to realize to say, this is what gives people opportunities that nobody's cracked this puzzle to say these are the perfect segments for our customers, which means every system can evolve to be better than even best in class today.
Well, I think what's really cool about the the data and the technology and some of the advances and how we're using it is actually we can do it both ways more easily now. So for example, the the personas are a great way to build alignment and do storytelling. So you can get people to share a vocabulary, to tell stories about the personas, to apply them in their work, and it helps build commonality across different parts of the company that they're able to share these personas and not use them as a series of one-off exercises. It lives on, it lasts eight years, like you mentioned, and, and that's a good thing if it builds alignment for a while. But the personas can become rigid because there are, I like to call them micro segments within your personas. And what you really want is the ability to tap into hundreds of micro segments with the data and they can ladder up to personas. You don't throw the personas out, but if you just live with four or five personas and aren't able to drive down to the micro segments, then you're really not taking advantage of the opportunity for experimentation in a way that's data driven. There you go. And you're also touching on an important point here, which is what's the role of data? And I find all too often companies look at it as data is to be the definitive answer to establish. They use the language source of truth. This is what we believe as if there's these mathematical constants, again, that explain our customer base. Now there's predictions and things that we can look at how customers will behave and estimates we can make about the future. But if people look at it to say data is really to tell us what our customers are doing today and what we think they might do in the future. But more importantly, they give their organization people room to move around those assumptions as they evolve. That's the right spot. Companies that give everyone the room to say, this is our best understanding of our customers at this moment with these tools, with this data. But knowing that in a year, it might look different and you're probably going to look backwards and say, well, we shouldn't have done that. But you're comfortable with it because it's part of the process versus there's some customers that say, Anybody that uses, they, they did this with a Google product one time. They said, anybody that uses this product spends X percent more with our ads. And nobody asked where that number came from or when was the last time it was checked. And it turned out the number was close to 11 years old. But entire product strategies were built on it because nobody questioned that number. And nobody wanted to question that number after that point to say, we built products assuming it was X and it really wasn't X. Why didn't we ask ourselves that? And that's, because of that experimentation mindset is that a lot of companies aren't using data and embracing data and their customers to become curious and understand the world. They're using it to provide an answer. And that answer makes them feel really good. Like, oh, we solved this. Did you? Did you? Or are you just telling yourself that because it justifies the effort? In your book, you also talk, Neil, about how you know, companies often don't get the ROI they're looking for from their investments in technology and in, in the MarTech stat, and that what enables them to get that ROI are the ways they use it, the way they change the behavior in the organization. Um, what are some of the ways companies can get started, you know, to start getting down that journey where they can start to get more ROI more from the way they're using the data, the way they're using the MarTech stat? Step one, don't, put, don't invest in technology, at least not yet. I refer to this, I don't know, I don't think this made it into the book, but I refer to this as kind of like the Bowflex or January gym problem where somebody's like in, in late December, like, oh, I'm out of shape. What do I do? Gym membership, right? It's tangible evidence of that commitment. You look at all the resources you have around you and you're like, look at what I can accomplish. And the absence of that gym membership, you look and you say, well, I'll never reach my goals if I don't get that gym membership. Okay. Now let's talk to the, let's actually talk to the gyms for people that sign up as a new year's resolution in January. On average, they will see those people about six times over the next 12 months, four of those times in January. And then never again, I could not find a closer proxy to marketing technology. People invest in like, we will become customized. We'll become one-to-one -one marketers. We will have personalization. We'll have clear reports. And then they focus entirely on the technology and then everyone sits there the next day and saying, well, we're still the same organization, just like we're the same person that walked into the gym. We have the same bad habits in terms of dieting, in terms of exercise, in terms of commitment. And so what I tell is I anybody that wants to get in shape, I say, good, put on the shoes you have, don't even buy new shoes and go for a walk. There, you're in slightly better shape than when you started. And if you're in marketing, start to do something with the data you have so that you can improve your business before looking and saying a MarTech stack is going to solve everything for us. 
And usually when people go down that quest, they get a better understanding as to what their business actually needs than letting technology companies define it for them. Now, this ties into a larger concern I have with AI, is that AI, a lot of companies are pushing the perennial CX use case. You can build a chatbot. And you look at all these visuals and you're like, well, this is a really impressive chatbot. And I go back and I say, are your customers actually asking for this technology? Do customers call up companies on the phone being like, you know what you're missing? You're missing a more elaborate phone menu. I really wish I could click buttons more times before talking to a customer service representative. Nobody has ever asked for this and nobody's ever asked for a chatbot. But the vendors are telling you this is a technology you somehow need. And so I say, go back to first principles. What are your customers actually asking for? What do your people actually need? What do they need to go on that walk? Build those practices first. And what you often find out is that the technology layer is not supposed to be your strategy at all. Just with the AI, companies ask me, What's my, what should my AI strategy be? Nothing. And I'm disappointed if you have one. What you really want to ask is, what's your business strategy? How are you going to serve your customers best? And how can AI or technology or marketing technology help support that goal, but not have that product actually lead the goal in the direction of your company in the first place? What happens is you lose control over your company. You hand everything over to the technology. And at the end of the day, you're not using any of it. This is why we mentioned in the book that these 95% of CRM implementations fail to meet their objectives because I don't think customers know what the hell they're trying to get out of them in the first place. They just feel bad. They don't have a CRM. A lot of um, technology investments are a long road to a small house. I like that. That would be appropriate. Right? They, take a they, take a, they take a long time and then they don't deliver the value that you wanted. I'm not saying that technology can't deliver value, but if, if you, if you approach it as a technology transformation, it's going to fail. It's not going to get you the ROI you want. It's going to take too long and it's going to, you, you know, things might even not be fully implemented at all. You might, you might move on to the next thing before it's done, which unfortunately happens a lot of the time. So I a hundred percent agree that, um, you know, focusing first on how do you actually build the insights? How do you start driving the behavior change in the organization? That's why I focus on CX and culture. The, the, the name of the book, the name of the podcast, it's right there. You know, it's uh, the books that I choose to review and talk about is because they really, you know, um, you know, have a, a similar spirit, which is if you want to drive impact, you got to impact people's behavior, not just implement technology. That's exactly where that balance lies. And, and to overuse that metaphor with the gym, it's not for me to say gyms are useless. Nobody needs to go to a gym. No, people should go, but they go there because they understand I've done as much as I can on my own. I asked myself those questions as opposed to throwing money directly at the problem. And that's the discipline, right? That we're talking about is that technology, whenever you look at some of these solutions, the real de definition, are you saying, should somebody else be changing my organization for me? Is this really what the solution is? I'm going to bring in another company that's going to install all this stuff and then my company will change. Or is it going to be from a leadership side, you're going to help people with that transformation? Because if your organization does not care about customers at its core and they're not incentivized to care about customers, I can give you all the journey mapping software and solutions you love, but it's not going to change how people are making decisions in your organization unless you can help them with that first. And I'm going to... Um bring it back to something you were saying a moment ago about chatbots and taking a slightly different direction the way I think that proves your point, which is chatbots on their own aren't something people are clamoring for. But but people are engaging in chat. The, if you look at the volume of chat, it's actually outstripped social last year. So there's more engagement in chat. Now, a lot of that is a bad experience where people are doing this and they're, you know, unintentionally, or they're being, it's being thrust upon them. But there are experiences that are well designed where people are engaging in chat and getting a more personalized experience as a result of it. In the case of a hotel or engaging with a retailer on a path to purchase, you're actually engaging them before the end of the journey, during the journey, ideally. And this is an opportunity to create more value. So the, if the company approaches chat with a customer centric lens of how am I going to deliver something that the customer wants, that's a better experience, they'll actually get more insights from regular engagement in chat than they will from surveys, but they have to approach it through a, the lens of giving something of value to the customer. Yes. That's, that's the right way to do it. Value versus right efficiency. 
I mean, I, I could argue. I, I, some, somewhere in the back of my head, as you were saying that, I was like, I bet 90% of that volume on chatbots are people furiously typing agent, agent, live person. Some of the best experiences that I have had personally with chat, Marriott is a great example. You go to a hotel and they say, our front desk is always here. You can call us like you've always. But here's also a chat in case you need to reach us for anything. And it goes directly to someone that's probably not even located in the hotel, can be anywhere around the world to resolve the issue. That gives me another way that I can interact as a customer with a brand. And in fact, I had a great experience. I was at a conference. I was, I was in the audience. I couldn't possibly call the hotel, but I left one of my bags alongside my breakfast table. And I was able to text them. They were able to address the issue and come back to me over chat. And I'm like, this is a phenomenal experience. It's when chat and some of these tools start to be looked at purely from efficiency. That's when they concern me the most because, well, let's see how we can substitute A and B when customers aren't asking for another substitute. They're fine with the solution. They, they like other channels, but they don't want one to go away in favor of the other. And then they feel forced down that path. A lot of um, um, B2B companies need, and this is true in, in certain consumer markets where expertise is really important, like in, in beauty and healthcare. But the, in a lot of B2B markets, they're trying to project expertise into the market. And they're trying to get their people to engage with customers and build relationships, the word you emphasize, and actually develop insights and act in a way with their customers where they deliver that expertise and there's value and they build trust. Now, one of the constraints that I often see working with clients in that space is how do you scale that expertise and how do you take advantage of digital to deliver it? more efficiently and effectively to more people? How do you create an always on experience? How do you augment your people so that you can deliver that to more people? The key thing is to not deliver a worse experience as you embrace digital and self-service. You wanna replicate your expertise and replicate the relationships. And chat actually can play a role in an always on experience if you do it in a way that doesn't undermine the emotional connection, that doesn't undermine the value of the expertise you're delivering. So you gotta be careful how you deliver it, that you don't make things worse and just focus on expediency and cost. It's actually an opportunity if you do it the right way, whether it's chat or voice assistance or things like that, this is a chance to build a faster insight to action loop and actually start optimizing the experience based on the data. Well, absolutely. And, and that, that value part and understanding how you're delivering value to customers is paramount. You know, one of the challenges I have with that idea of scale is a lot of young companies I work with look at scale to say, scale, scale for us is going from 100 customers to a million customers. But they miss the part about scaling where scale actually requires you to deliver that same experience, that same caliber of experience to all those people. Otherwise, you're just transforming what could be a very successful product into a watered down mass market version for the sake of reaching those numbers and that volume of customers. And so to organize everyone's thoughts, if you're really, this is the best way I like to look at scale. Deliver the best possible experience you can to one customer. Then figure out how to deliver that same experience to two, to a hundred, to a thousand. And then you're actually achieving scale. But it'd be almost like a fine dining restaurant to say, look what we can do. And at mass market, we can take our food and we can freeze it and we can ship it to grocery stores. And you look at it you're like, well, how sad has your product become? And what a lot of companies also find is that for the customers that are used to receiving the full experience, and let's use phone as a great differentiator, discover credit cards I love. Their, one of their value propositions is you can talk to a human being on the phone. That seems to be the only thing they push in their commercials and customers love it. Well, it's to say, if you're able to get people to charge more money for being able to talk directly to people, if you're able to get people to stay with you longer, to be happier with your products and services, wouldn't you want to invest in those areas? Or does everything have to be about commoditizing those experiences? And a lot of companies don't think about this, which is, I think, one of the issues that we're talking about is as technology advances, companies need to understand where their values are and where their customers' values are. If you get a generation of customers that say, look, I don't want to talk to you over the phone to change my insurance policy. The windshield on my car broke yesterday. While I was sitting in the parking lot, I was able to file a claim with State Farm. The agent wasn't there. It's a weekend. But I was able to do it. That made my life easier, and it was done entirely on a chat bot. But if I ever called up my agent and said, hey, Harold, I need help with filing a claim, he's like, all right, so Neil, the first step is go to the app store and download the State Farm app. Then I feel like, well, that doesn't reflect the way that I want to engage with your brand. 
And so sometimes companies just need to think about that for a moment to say, really, where are the unmet needs from our customers that will help us scale in the way that we want to scale as a business? That's something saying we're going to force this on people because then we'll hit that imaginary number. The third imperative in you talked about with the self-help, self-improvement for marketers acting as change agents in their company. So if they're acting as a change agent, they want a guide to help them be a better change agent. You know, what are some of the behaviors that marketers need to focus on, you know, that you're that you write about in your book and in your experience? Well, let's start with the basics. I have yet to meet any company. And I've met with several thousand companies, 40 something countries, every vertical. I have yet to meet a company that says we cannot change. We have never been, we cannot innovate. We cannot transform. Every company believes they can. And then they follow you with the litany of reasons why they can't. We can change. No, but we also have the board. We have the CFO that wants to make us happy. Our customers are stubborn. And they create all of these constraints around them where the, the capabilities of what they're able to transform are subject to everything they said that they can't do. And they narrow down their scope so small that even the best transformation isn't going to change much. And so the first thing I have to look at is I have to look at and say, all right, let's actually start with this. What level of change can you affect in your organization and why? And are those constraints real? And the more you talk to people in the organization, the more you realize that there's historical constraints that nobody's actually pushed up against. They say, well, Wall Street always expects this or our board always expects that. That's a lot of the reasons why with customer behavior, they focus on short-term versus long-term metrics. But have you ever told your board that story? And if they rejected it, it could have been the way that you told that story. And I've told it wrong plenty of times. I cover that in the very last chapter of the book, one of the times I failed talking to a board. You need to go through that process. And so first part of changing any of these processes are just getting people to accept that a lot of the constraints that they added are self-imposed. And then once they realize that, then you start saying, well, what does great look like? If you had to leave and start your own business today, what would you do differently? And can you make that case to other people? Because if you're not making it to your internal team, if you go out and try to raise money on your own, you'll have to do it. And if you believe it's the right way, if your team believes it's the right way to do something, you're saying the organization isn't allowing it to happen, then I will give you my next best piece of advice. Take all those people that are true believers and leave your company and go build your own. One that does it the right way. Take all your expertise because then you will challenge that, that incumbent organization to do things a better and a right way. And so a lot of these cases when we're talking about transformation in organizations come down to people feeling empowered that they can actually make that change. And if a leader does not, if I talk to a leader who will give me the reason why all the things are limited, then I know they're not going to be the person to lead that organization through that change. And that's fine. Not everyone is supposed to fill that role. But that's the first question you have to ask. If you really want to transform your organization's capabilities, do you believe you can do it? Or do you believe that there's this organization that's going to prevent all that stuff from happening? In which case, and that's going to tell you your leadership style and whether you're the right person to bring it through. Best people I love working with are people that look at the realities of their organization and completely ignore them. We have these processes and tools. The long... Uh, what was that? There's a, that story of Steve Jobs at one point when he was at Apple and realized how bureaucratic they became. That He decided, you know what? I can't fix this organization. What I'm going to do is take a group of engineers. We're going to go rent sep separate office space. I believe they even flew a pirate flag outside of their little building to say, we're going to use all the capital, all the good stuff of Apple, the job security. But then we're going to jettison all the process so that we can build what's necessary. And I just love that simple story because it's someone saying, I recognize what I can and can't do in the organization, and I'm going to do what I want anyways. And that's what's necessary for those transformations to occur. One other last thing I'll mention on this transformation, why it makes it so difficult, is that whenever you're changing, whether it's metrics or processes, there are teams that are going to win and teams that are going to lose. And so let's talk. We've been talking about chatbots. If you're launching a chatbot, there's going to be a team that manages your call center with people that say now they're being displaced and made redundant. If you're using AI to build better creatives, you're going to have a creative team that's going to say, well, now you don't need us. And that's what slows down that transformation. So people that see the resources and the priorities being drained from them. 
And you need to be able to manage that tension appropriately. So if you go out there and you say, well, we don't need our phone center team, or we don't need our creatives anymore because we have AI to do it. Congratulations. You just created two very large established groups of stakeholders that are going to fight you on every step of your transformation, unless you give them a place where they can also be successful in it. And I'm not saying training AI, but you need to be able to find out to say, well, what is the role that we can assign that these valuable resources can still provide to our company? One of the uh, catchphrases that I love that I, I forget where I first heard this, but I use it a lot. So I'm sorry, I can't give attribution to the person who shared it with me, but um, people embrace what they help create. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in like working in you know, consulting and change and experience design. Well, if you, if you involve people in the change process and get them to help create the solution, they actually will embrace it. And conversely, if you create something and bring it back to them later, they're more likely to resist it. That's like the, the not invented here, or there's all, they'll focus on the barriers and the obstacles and all the things you mentioned. But if you get them in the boat early, and get them to actually not just be consulted on the barriers and how to address them, but help create what you're doing. No, you know, now you, what you're highlighting is, you know, you can't force it, but if you give them something to contribute to that, they're part of the broader solution that, then maybe you're more likely to be successful. And the good thing about customer experience is there's lots of ways people can contribute across the company to customer experience. So even if chatbots undermines one aspect of the people in the call center, there's call volume going down. Well, you can engage them on what other things they can do to add more value, which might actually give them a, a reason to expand what they're doing, even if they're reducing certain types of calls. That, that's exactly it. And it's why time and time again, some of the best people I've seen lead transformations of their organizations are empathetic storytellers. People that can see what the audience is thinking, what they're feeling, and can tell them a story about the role they're playing and where the organization is going to go as a result of that change. And I talk about that loosely in the book, one of the stories where I went in front of a board and I said, look, here's all the data that says, this is how you should manage your customers. And they saw it as a threat for accountability. So we were proposing, let's look long-term at how your customers behave. And the board's response was, so you're saying I'm not going to hold you accountable for today's performance or this week's performance, or this quarter's performance, but that I'm supposed to hold you accountable for what these customers will do in years? Sounds ridiculous. We'll keep you to the 24-hour, the seven-day windows that you have. But on the other hand, if you say, here's your best customers, the people that will come back over the years and keep buying over and over again, and here's your customers that will be seen once and never seen again, and you're spending the same time on equal, equal time on both, you say, wait a minute. Why are we doing that? Well, it's because we're only looking short term. And now they can become part of that solution and that story. And how you communicate this is vitally important. And it's oftentimes, this is where people, we love data, but we're still human beings. And we make that decision with our heart. And so you need to be able to cross both of those sides to be successful in this space. I love in your book, the emphasis on rewarding ideas, rewarding ideation rather than just results. And you share a number of examples um, of companies that are focusing on encouraging ideation versus just metrics that are, you know, um, to reward the, the result after the work has been done. I'd love for you to share a little more with the audience, a little bit more about this, you know, why reward ideation and, and how do you make that happen? It's, you know, I'll tell you this, you know how many calls I get from people where they're like, can you give me experiments? I was like, I have ideas. All right, what do you want? Well, anything where we know 90 to 95% chance that test is going to be successful. Now think about this from a leadership side. You're stacking the deck. Why are we wasting time running tests? Why are we celebrating the results if we already knew the results going in? And this is what happens. You have had such horrible trust in your own intuition that you have to run a test for something you already know the answer to. You're, yeah, and you're delaying your decision-making <laughs> process. I'm going to come to you and say, I know. What if let's go 100%, right? I know with 100% certainty, this will work out. And you're like, okay, good. Let's test this first. And let's delay our decision-making process for eight months, the opportunity costs add on, and then let's celebrate. You know, we're going to celebrate you because this test worked. 
you know, by the way, this isn't that far from a lot of people. Oftentimes when I present academic research, here's something that's been vetted for 20 years. And I have someone come up to me like, that was a great insight. We're going to test this back at the office. I was like, damn it. No, that's exactly what we said. We weren't going to do. We weren't going to test. We're going to implement. The thing is that nobody should know what the outcome of that experiment is. If somebody comes to you with a great idea that's backed by data and that has a path forward for your organization, that's where you want to recognize and celebrate them. If they know it's going to work out, congratulations. We're not going to test that. We're going to implement it right away. Thank you for bringing that to me. I'm sorry we didn't catch that before. But if you want people to take risks, then you have to decide where you want them. If you're going to say, we know things that are 90, 95% true, if that's your risk threshold, and for some companies it is, I won't judge them on that alone. But I will say, congratulations. Those opportunities are things that the market has already discovered and validated that you should have adopted a long time ago. Sorry, we should put a first name in a subject line. That was vetted, what, 2003, 2004 by a Stanford study? And some people are still like, oh, we, we tested that now. No, you should have already had that into play. Your organization is behind. But for those organizations that are saying, hey, here's what I want. I want something that's better than a coin toss. Give me something. More than 50% likely that this experiment will play off. This is going to be something at the edge that a lot of companies haven't tried, a lot of companies haven't validated, but they see an opportunity in it. You want to recognize people that find those ideas. If you're looking at everything those people see and you see the potential in it, go run that test, but that's where the responsibility for that first person ends. If they know the outcome of the test, it was a terrible test. They shouldn't. And so you want to celebrate them for bold, audacious ideas that can move the company forward. Your role as a leader is to encourage more of those ideas and then to take it off their shoulders, run with it, get it implemented, and then let them go back out into that data, into their customers and find more of those things for you. You know, I really enjoyed our conversation. I loved your book. and I've enjoyed um, uh, chatting about it on the podcast. I also thought you were a really good speaker when I saw you speak at the Optimove event in London. Um, what, um, what are the ways that you like to get engaged and, and, and share about your book? Is it, did you, are, are you open to speaking at, at company events or, or what are the best ways for people to reach out to you? I, I love just to be useful. Uh, I have my preference on channels. I love speaking live. Podcasts are fantastic. Sometimes people just message me on LinkedIn with their questions. And that's part of that, that, that very core thread through the book is about how with so much data, we lose that connection to humanity. And so I often focus very deliberately on whatever I'm doing to say, what's the right, not only message, but what's the right medium to influence that level of organizational change? And so that's really taking it off the shoulders of the people I interact with. The people often reach out to me and say, hey, how can you help me do this? And it's fun just to talk through and to figure out well, what's the right channel and the right approach to get this message and this content through your organization. Well, you've sparked a lot of great ideas for me. I'm, I know you have for the audience. Thanks so much for, um, for coming on the podcast today. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks again for having me.